Hello and welcome to episode 12 of the How to Survive podcast. Episode 12? Already? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm Joe. Joining me as ever. Uh, this week we're going to be talking, as it is Halloween, mm-hmm. uh, about the happy, film. Happy Halloween, everyone. Happy Halloween. Uh, I'm sure it's all a holiday that you adhere to mm-hmm. strongly. Yeah, yeah. Um, we do. Um, all, all Hallows' Eve. Yes, yeah. exactly. Where does it come from, Halloween? Um, well... You sound like someone who would know. Well, I don't. So okay. you, you've embarrassed me. Maybe it's uh, to do with witches? Spooks? All, all Hallows' Eve. I don't know. I don't know. It, sound, it sounds like the sort of thing that would be... Like the Day of the Dead sort of thing, right? Right. Well, like a specific regional cultural thing. Yeah, maybe. But then it's only celebrated in America, really. Yeah. It's much more an American thing than here, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, the film Halloween, yeah. however, is an international... Phenomenon. Phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, it was released in 1978. It was directed by John Carpenter. Yeah. Started out the whole Halloween uh, franchise. Yeah. And introduced us to Michael Myers. Yeah. Who later went on to star in Shrek... And, uh, Austin Bauer. <laughs> Very good. Mm. Uh, yeah. Um, so as ever, we will be covering the film in detail. So if you don't know the film, go watch it. It's freely available mm-hmm. almost everywhere. Yeah, you can and find you can it. follow the link on our website, uh, howtosurviveshow dot com. Yep, where you will find all of our uh, past podcasts um, and all the things that go along with them as well. Yeah. So uh, we begin in nineteen sixty four on Halloween. Mm. Uh, Judith Myers is uh, cavorting with her boyfriend, um, and we see the see her around her house and kissing, etc. Mm. Uh, through the eyes of an unknown assailant who picks up a knife in the kitchen, and makes his way upstairs, and then brutally murders Judith Myers. Yep. Uh, and then goes downstairs and outside, where it is revealed the eyes through which we have been seeing this murder. Is that are those of six-year-old Michael Myers? Yeah, her younger brother. Yep, brutal murder, really, for a for a six-year-old. D- for a six-year-old, yeah. Mm. Um, for a seven-year-old, it's pretty tame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's the sort of what you'd say the pre-title sequence, almost. Yeah, the the kind of you know the uh, introduction, the the prologue. Yeah. Mm. Um, so uh, he's locked away, you know, for the murder mm. in a sort of uh, mental institution. Yeah, high, high security mental institution. Yeah, uh, and then uh, on October 30th, 1978, 15 years later. Yeah, so he's 21 now. Yeah, um, he uh, manages to escape and his first instinct is to head back to Haddonfield, Illinois, mm-hmm. where the Myers family lived. Uh, and uh, wreak havoc, Joe. Yeah. Wreak bloody murder. Which he does. I mean, spoiler alert. He, he gets back. He's, he's chased uh, by Dr. Sam Loomis, who's, um, who tried to warn them about uh, Michael Myers many times. Played by Donald Pleasance. Donald Pleasance. He's, he's great in it as yeah. well. He's, he adds like a sort of gravitas that's... Um, yeah, in the same way that, that um, Mrs. Voorhees acts yeah, yeah. was it kind of like... Above the film. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah he's because um, the only other thing I think I've seen Donald Pleasance in is uh, is Blofeld. Right. right? Yeah. Um, so uh, it's, it's interesting to see him in like such a totally different role. So Dr. Sam Loomis follows the trail of destruction that Michael Myers leaves all the way back to Haddonfield. Mm-hmm. He's uh, on the hunt for the uh, escaped killer. Yeah. Um, I mean, already I've got one point to make. You're making this sound like a very linear... Like a chase film or yeah. something, yeah. Um, uh, well, what I was going to say was, meanwhile... Right. Uh, we've got the main character of Laurie, played mm-hmm. by Jamie Lee Curtis, in yeah, her yeah. first film role. Really? I, th- so I believe so. It says introducing Jamie okay, Lee Curtis. Right. In, in the same way as Nightmare on Elm Street was introducing, introducing Johnny, Johnny Depp. Depp. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, she's a sort of uh, 17-year-old mm. um, girl. She's, she still looks... In her thirties, yeah, for for Jamie Lee Curtis, yeah. yeah, she, uh, yeah, she's she's in her, you know, teenage years. She's still in high school. Mm-hmm. She does babysitting yes. in the evenings and the weekends, um, and uh, she is looking after a young boy, Tommy, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, we see we see the day of October thirty first through yeah. her eyes. Um, you know, she goes to school. She's meeting with her friends. There's the typical gossip and. Uh, banter yeah. between friends but she's been stalked by a sort of uh, mysterious presence yes um, who I mean we know yeah. through, through the benefit of uh, 
pop culture that, yeah. that that person's talking about is Michael Myers in his iconic white mask. Yeah. But she doesn't know that yet. No. She um, thinks it's her friend's playing pranks. Yes. Playing uh, pranks. Playing pranks. Playing pranks. Praying pranks. <laughs> Praying pranks. Yeah. Um, yeah. She uh, goes on Halloween night mm-hmm. to look after Tommy. Uh, her friend Annie is uh, also looking after a child just mm-hmm. down the road. And uh, there's there's a lot of sort of tension building. You know, like lots of shots from outside houses looking in and all that mm-hmm. sort of thing. It's setting up the whole home invasion angle. Yeah. And then eventually Annie leaves her charge in the care of Laurie because she wants to go off and meet her boyfriend. Mm. Um, she goes and gets in her car. And this has been coming for a, a while by this point. Yeah. Um, she's murdered by Michael Myers, who's mm. hiding in the back of her car. Yes. Uh, later on, another one of Laurie's friends, Linda, uh, arrives with her boyfriend uh, to the same house. Mm. And uh, they go off and cavort. Yeah. After sex, uh, Bob, her boyfriend, goes downstairs uh, to get beer. Yeah. And uh, it's... it's confronted with uh, Michael Myers, yeah. who um, lifts him up with one hand and impales him into the kitchen cupboards. With a knife. With a knife. Yeah. Um, Michael Myers then dresses in a sheet and goes yeah. upstairs pretending to be Bob. Well, pretending to be Bob. Okay, he's pretending to be Bob, pretending to be a ghost. Yeah. He's wearing Bob's glasses. glasses yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, he murders her as well. Yeah. And um, I think, and then Laurie. At this point, uh, I think as as Linda is being murdered, she calls Laurie, mm. who is alerted to the fact that something isn't quite right by the sound of the murder. Initially, Laurie I think thinks that Linda's accidentally called her mm. mid rumpus. Yeah. Uh, but uh, actually, what she's hearing is uh, Linda being murdered. Yes. Um, for for one reason or another, eventually uh, Laurie puts the kids to bed and goes over to the house to investigate and finds the bodies of her friends. Mm. Um, at this point, she's attacked. They've all been sort of put in weird positions, like one's been crammed into a, the airing cupboard. Yeah. One's hanging, hanging upside, upside down. down. There's one which is the um, is splayed out on the bed with the headstone of... Uh, the murdered... Yeah. Judith? Judith yeah. Myers. Sorry. So there's one, one body has been left splayed out on the bed with the headstone of Judith Myers, the mm. actual gravestone, yeah. uh, on the bed above her. And that's the first body that Laurie finds. Mm. And then... Stumbles into the others yeah. in a kind of home alone way. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and then she gets attacked by Michael, mm. manages to escape, like runs to neighbours' houses... They, they don't want to know. They don't they're, not know. they're not interested, yeah. Whether they think it's a prank or they understand the severity of the situation, they're just not interested, mm. I don't know. But they um, eventually, she runs back to the house. She tries to hide. So she manages to fight back, stabs Michael in the neck with a knitting needle initially, right. uh, and then um, manages to stab him in the eye with a coat hanger. Mm-hmm. And then... Uh, she picks up his knife and yeah. stabs him... In the chest with it. Yeah, and and by this point you you're sort of realising that there's something, something, sort of supernatural about Michael <laughs> yeah. Myers. Like he's not he's not going down. Yeah. Um. She she thinks the deed is done. Mm. Uh, and there's that great shot where she's it's a fourth dawn sort of thing. Yeah. Well, there's a great shot where she's got her sort of head in it, head in her hands and in the background Michael Myers sits, sits up, up. Yeah. in a very sort of robotic like, mm-hmm. you know, vampiric way. Yep. And then um, he attacks her one final time and then. Dr. Loomis shows up just in the nick of time and guns him, guns him down. Yep. Six shots. He tumbles over the balcony and, uh, and Laurie says, was he the boogeyman? And Dr. Sam Loomis says, yes, he was. He goes over to the balcony to look upon Michael Myers' body and he's gone. And that's how the film ends. Yeah, Halloween. Yeah, as a cliffhanger. Um, so what did you think of... John Carpenter's 1978 film, Halloween. Well, I think there's a very fine line between tension and absolute interminable boredom. Right. And mm-hmm. I think this strays into the wrong side of that um, okay. for most of the film. Uh, and that's my opinion on it. Right. That's the podcast. Thanks a lot for tuning in. <laughs> right. Okay. What, what specifically, what like scenes... Well, okay. So basically, the... The idea of tension in this movie is established only by playing like plinky plonk piano music. 
Right. Doing, ding, I can't remember the tune. Yeah, yeah. Ding, 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 the ding, theme ding, tune. Ding, yeah. ding, 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 it's kind of like Exorcist, tubular yeah. bells. And it, that's, that's pretty much all they've got to go on. Other than that, it's just people walking around. Right. And it, it's just into, like, so take for instance the first the first murder in uh, in the movie, other than the, the opening one. Yeah. Which is Annie. In the that, car. Yeah, in the car. That takes probably 45 minutes to come to fruition. Yeah. And there's there's all these like, oh, well, she's stuck in the window. There's, but pretty much everything that happens to Annie is just so ridiculously far-fetched right. that it's boring. Like, she get, she spills butter down herself <laughs> when she's making popcorn. Yeah. And the only sort of thing she thinks to do is strip to her pants. Yeah. She didn't get stuck in a window. Yeah. In she's not even being chased at this point. She's no, just she's just uh, she's managed to get locked inside the laundry. Yeah, because Michael Myers has locked her in there actually. Yeah. yeah. But there's no real reason for that. Yeah, it's um, it's I I understand what you mean. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, his motives are, are curious. Yeah, uh, I mean he, at this point, if you look at Freddy Krueger, right, he wants revenge. Yeah. If you look at Mrs. Voorhees, Pamela Voorhees. She wants revenge. Mm-hmm. Jason, in the, the later Friday the 13th, he wants revenge. Yeah. The alien in Alien, I mean, we can make an assumption that he's probably wanting to breed. Mm-hmm. Kathy Bates in Misery. Yeah. She's either desperately in love with uh, Paul Sheldon or she wants financial gain by exploiting his work. Yeah. Now, I ask you, what, why does Michael Myers want to kill people? So there's been some discussion at earlier points in the film about his psychology mm-hmm. and... Um, you know, Dr. Loomis has worked with him for many years before the film, and then, uh, you know, he, he says something like, I spent seven years, you know, trying to reach him, trying to make him communicate, mm-hmm. and then eight years trying to make sure that he stayed exactly where he was. Yeah. Because so he made that judgment about a, you know, 12 year old. Yes. But, uh, well, that's, I mean, we'll talk about the, <laughs> the expertise of Dr. Loomis a little yeah. later. Because that, that certainly merits discussion. Mm. But in the meantime, do you, do you agree with me that it is a, in terms of a boring film? No, I don't, I, I don't, I don't agree, actually. Okay. Um, I think the tension of it is, is um, while, like, today, it seems a bit sort of substandard, if you compared it to something like, for example, It Follows, where the tension's pretty, um, like, constant and inescapable. I think... There is a similar thing there, but I'd like it's just not as well realised, or we're not as susceptible to it mm. because we're modern movie guys. Right, but I guess if this has never been seen before, you don't know what's going to come next. Whereas yeah. we do. Yeah, because this, you know, this is one of the one of the, you know, prototype slasher films, mm-hmm. and so um, you know the the tropes of slasher films are, you know, are new in this film in the context of watching it in 1978. So you're not necessarily, you're not sure like, you know maybe the the idea that w- they get picked off one by one or you know mm. all those sorts of things they're not as they're not as like well worn out cliches right but uh, I I what I I quite like that Michael Myers because like the whole revenge angle for like Jason for mm. example like it doesn't necessarily make sense for him to continue his crusade against people who are nothing to do with it right like uh, like you know further further films down the series. You know, like Jason goes into space, yeah, like, yeah. and it's like in the future, and yeah, all that sort of he thing. just mistakes everyone for people who killed his mother. Yeah, Nightmare mm. on Elm Street. Similarly, Freddy Krueger. You know, that he has a reason for killing in the first film or the first mm. couple of films, but like that loses it further on down the series. So I don't, I don't know necessarily that him not having a motive or as strong a motive other than he's evil is necessarily a reason for it to not work effectively fair enough I guess that's that's valid so what you're saying is to take it with take it as a product of its environment it, it came from a time where that was new and being evil was enough of a motive yeah like um, I think it almost it almost feels like a bit of like a um, nightmarish or sort of a supernatural environment almost like right. like the scene where Laurie runs out of her house she runs to the neighbour's house and you know they they turn the lights on. They look outside to her screaming for help, and then they don't. Mm. They just turn the lights back off. They don't. They're not. They don't want to be involved, right? That's like a nightmarish sort of idea, isn't it? Like you're being chased, and no one helps you, or no one realizes that you need help, or something mm. like that. And then Michael Myers is a is a is an image 
you know, the constant slow walking presence. Right. Is like he's not, he, yeah, he's not um running at them. No. Or, and he doesn't at any point in the film. He's like a slow yeah. calculating sort of just step by step walking speed killer. Mm. Yeah. Um which is something to bear in mind when thinking of how to survive. Um like you're right in the sense that all the beats of the film feel really familiar. Yeah. But I, I think you could argue that that just shows that it's a really influential film. As opposed to it necessarily being a bad film. Yeah, yeah. I, d- I don't think it's a bad film at all. Okay. Well, I, I mean, take the characters as well. The characters are slightly more memorable than in other horror films, arguably. Yeah. Perhaps, I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis, I know because you know, Jamie Lee Curtis, I'm going to remember her. Yeah. And I'm going to remember the girl who is stumbling around spilling butter on herself. And, yeah. Like, it's it's just yeah. so Buster ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess in the sense... Well, the, there's, only, there's only about five central characters aren't they well I'd say it's just those two girls well there's there's Linda as well who's the yeah but she, the, she she feels secondary yeah I guess so but maybe that, that, I suppose that's just because she turns up later in the film yeah. like or she, she you see her initially during the school scene yeah and she turns up later and there's a lot of there's a lot of time given over to I mean I reckon a good third of the film just the build up of Annie's death yeah that's probably true I think um, yeah I mean there is yeah, it's, it's building up, it's attempting to build up the tension, isn't it? Mm. Um, I guess because we're watching it with the knowledge of those sorts of tropes and how these films work, we're just waiting for her to be killed. Right, yeah, true. But uh, that, that's probably what, I mean, it's kind of like, just get it over with. Yeah, I guess so. But like, I quite like that the, the, um, the, the, I mean, like the opening scene is pretty iconic, um, I guess because of the ending, like, you know, you're, you're not expecting a six-year-old to be... Yeah, killer. Um, but like the the seeing stuff from the killer's perspective as like a motif is like continued throughout the film. Yes, um, and even in the scenes, you know, an early probably the first third of the film almost is is a lot of it is from Michael Myers' perspective, mm-hmm. and like you know you you're in the car with him as he's driving around the town and yeah. all that sort of thing, and that's quite unsettling and quite disturbing. Like the heavy breathing as well. Yes, yeah, he's a very cool, I think. Or like very creepy, you know, cue um, to sort of demonstrate his presence and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And like, you know, when you know there are, there are, there are shots where he walks for like you know Laurie will be walking off into the distance and then he'll walk from sort of behind the camera and stop just in front of it. Yeah. And you can just hear his heavy breathing. But that that I mean I know specifically the shot you're talking about yeah. is when she first she goes to the house to sort of prove yeah, she's yeah. got stones. That shot took about. 25 minutes to resolve <laughs> it was it's kind of like the the cars in, in Friday, Friday 13th yeah it just it was like just cut it there I get it, I get the idea that he's watching her you don't have to give me mm. 30 seconds unbroken of her walking away I, I do quite like that there's um like the blocking and the choreography like do you know blocking in terms of a filmmaking term it's like laying out a scene so you know you you block the scene so people um appear you know, like someone's oh, what, like, stood in front of one another, like in the yeah, screen, okay. so, so like you can see each other, in or you can see every person within the frame. Right. And so, like you know, you have if you have someone in the foreground who's on the right hand side, then someone else in the background you need to be on the left hand side because otherwise they'd be stood work. in front of each yeah. other. Um, like and the the sort of choreography, I guess, of the scene throughout the sort of stalking scenes mm-hmm. are, is really good, I think. And like the way Michael Myers appears, and then you know the camera looks over and then it looks back and he's gone all that sort of thing I think is, is good and it's um, I think especially now looking back on because I th- I'd say the vast majority of horror films nowadays are sort of CGI focused yeah I think so you know like a lot of paranormal things are trending at the moment you know mm. insidious and paranormal activity and you know all those sorts of films yeah. and um, you know it's, it's, it's I think it's more clever you, you get if it's better when you see that it's like a real person and it's like they just they've obviously just like nipped out of the frame yeah. or whatever while the camera's not been looking but I th- I th- and I think that's a really effective thing like the, the film The Strangers does that really well right yeah um, yeah but I, th- I think all that uh, I think that's, that's good I mean like you're talking about The Friends mm. 
Annie, the character of Annie, is just horrible. She's like a, the worst nightmare babysitter. Yes. Like she's she is more concerned with having sex with her boyfriend than looking after the the, ch- the child in her care. Yeah, the child yeah. that she like shouts at, belittles, yeah. berates, like constantly. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, she's like she's, she's she also a- invites her friends over to have sex in the marriage bed of the homeowners. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, like, America... One thing, one thing that when we're talking about how to survive, the sort of American Midwestern neighbourhood that's depicted in the film, I think, is, comes into play. But, yeah, like, you know, clearly that's just a, a culture where it's fine for, like, strangers to go into someone's house and just shag in the... In their beds. In yeah. their homeowner's beds. Um, you know, that's, that's absolutely fine. So there's the scene where Laurie's been... It's become clear that Laurie's being stalked. Yes. By a presence, which and Michael Myers is only referred to as the shape in the credits. That's what really? crazy does, yeah. Um, so she's being she's being followed by the shape, right? And uh, you know, at first she's walking down the street, and he's stood next to a hedge, just looking at her. Yeah. And then he walks behind the hedge. He's disappeared. Then she goes home. She gets up to her room. Well, there is the, the he drives past her at one point. Yeah, well, there's there's a few. I'm yeah. saying there's a few. Different yeah, yeah. Ones, But then, the, like, you see the hedge scene, and then immediately afterwards, she goes home. Mm-hmm. She goes up to her room, looks out of the window, and in her neighbor's garden, stood amongst the laundry, is Michael Myers in a blue boiler suit right. and a white rubber mask, right? Looking at her. It's, yeah, it's he's blatant, staring into like, her soul. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, on a scale of one to ten, Joe, how appropriate do you think her response to that is? Because her response appears to be like. Oh, that's a, there's a, a man in the garden. Yeah. That's fine. Like, I mean, that's a little bit. I'm perturbed by that. Yeah. Uh, and I'll tell my mate about that, but I won't press the point any more than going. Oh, that's a bit weird. <laughs> so zero being zero being like you would see it and just you'd take it in on like an informational level, right? Like a sort of there's like it registers it's like <laughs> you look out the window and you go right there's there are there are some clouds in the sky that it's slightly windy there's a man in the garden there's uh, <laughs> laundry up next door yeah like and 10 being and 10 being like this you, man wants to kill me yeah 10 being you phone the police and like cower under your bed um i think hers is the lower end it's probably more a two yeah like yeah. she's she's not I would be more unsettled by that than she is. Maybe she's just a hardy individual. Yeah. I mean, you'd expect... There's certain things you expect to see in your neighbour's garden when you look out the window. And a man who you've already seen stalking you, mm. wearing a mask, staring at you. Yeah. It's... it's yeah, it's an odd one. Yeah. Um, so Laurie survives. Oh, yeah, as she does. Um, you seem disappointed. No, no. Uh, well, what I was going to say was... We, we, always, we often talk on this show about the trend in horror films. The kids who die in horror films are the promiscuous ones. Right. And this film bears that out in oh, a yeah. she's, very precise she's, she's smart. She's celibate. Yeah. She's not going to... I mean, you, you know, based on horror movie cliches, you know that she isn't going to die. No. Because she's smart and celibate. Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, like whether or not that's, that's a trend that started through this film. Mm. Like, I'd be, I'd be curious to know, like, if it is as blatant as like a group of people sitting down and going, like, what are the what are the constituent parts of like these films that work? Mm. Like, because if if someone was saying to you like, what do you like about the slash slash films? You might say, oh, you know, like the stalking element, or you know, yeah, like the, that build up of tension, sense of dread, yeah, yeah, and all that sort of thing, like people getting picked off one by one. But like, you wouldn't necessarily be like, oh, I like that the teenagers who have sex are the ones who die. Yeah. And it's the, weird, what, isn't it? the virginal ones don't. It's a really weird thing to sort of perpetuate. Yeah. I guess in, I, in Friday the 13th, to some extent, there's like an overall logic to it because Jason dies while the counsellors are having, the sex. Are having yeah. it. Yeah. So there, there is an element, you know, you understand why specifically teenagers having sex would perturb. Mrs. Voorhees, yeah. that she'd be, she, it's a sticking point for her because yeah. that's how her son died. Exactly, yeah. In Halloween, is it implied, do you, do you feel, that part of the reason for Michael's initial killing of his sister Judith is because she's getting off of this guy? Well, because she's naked as well. She's half yeah. naked when yeah, she's yeah. topless, basically, when she's murdered as well. It's weird, isn't it? Because he's six, because you don't, you don't want to put too much 
No. On him because I, I don't think he's sexually motivated. And he doesn't. He doesn't just, murder his parents, for example. We then never mentioned. No, but they they arrive to find him sat on the oh, doorstep. Right. Yeah, you're right. And he's holding the knife. Yeah. You know, it's prime. Well, yeah, I suppose it's almost like he is murdering... But no, he he does murder men as well, because I thought... He does murder men, but the men who have sex. Like, what I'm saying is that... I I guess there's there's two questions I'm asking, really. One is, is Michael Myers killing people because they're having sex? And two, do you think that somewhere, a group of people who decided that they wanted to make money from making horror films identified that as, like, a constituent part of the successful horror films? Like, I wonder if there's... I wonder if there's like a, an attempted, you know, slasher film or a slasher film that maybe wasn't as popular as, for example, Halloween mm. or Friday the 13th, that isn't as successful and doesn't feature promiscuous teenagers getting killed. Well, I think it comes from the sort of urban legend sort of stories right. where two, two kids would go down to Lover's Lane yeah. and there they would be attacked by a man with a hook for a hand mm. or aliens from space. So I think it goes, but I think it does go back further to sort of the 1950s films, where they would not necessarily have sex, but they'd go. It would be a romantic sort of thing, and something would pop up between them, and yeah, you know. So, so do you think that? Um, I think this is just taking that to the nth degree. Yeah. Do you think that's rooted? Possibly. It reminds me a bit of the Zodiac killer. Yeah. Um, he's a serial killer, uh, a real life serial killer, in the 1960s and 70s. Mm-hmm. In America. Depicted in the David Fincher movie, Zodiac. Yes. And um, he, uh, I don't think exclusively, but frequently targeted couples mm-hmm. who were, you know, in lovers' lanes or, you know, mm. uh, somewhere private, basically. So I wonder when this film comes out 15 years later or so, or, you know, even maybe even eight years later, you know, a few years after yeah. these killings. Whether it's so ingrained in the public consciousness that it's sort of an obvious choice. Yeah, like whether it's an intentional filmmaker's decision to mm. um, build, you know, that trope around a sort of in, ingrained public fear. M- fear, yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's interesting. Because, it, I mean, there's lots of things it could be, you know. It could be the idea that when you first do it, you're, you're making yourself more vulnerable or you're giving something away. And I mean, it could be related to sort of religion, yeah. Sort of the sin of doing it, doing it. <laughs> the, the sort of sin of having sex outside of marriage, right? Yeah. It could be associated all these sort of fears around that, which are just manifesting themselves in the form of a violent killer. Yeah. And that that's kind of what, when we we talked about it follows in episode yeah. two. Go back and listen to that by all means. But not now. I mean, here I still got this first. Then <laughs> go back. I mean, the the biggest thing about that that you kind of get from it is perhaps that. It's about the anxiety around sex for yeah. teenagers. Yeah. And perhaps all these films that sort of prey on that, that fear. Because, I mean, we're not the target market for these films. No. They are teenagers who presumably do have anxieties around sex. So yeah. it makes sense that you tie that together, maybe. Yeah. No, it, it, it's, it's, it's um, a strong enough, consistent element yeah. that I think it, it must have some sort of root like that. But do you think it's... Re- like, in a million years, if you had a, a focus group and you said, oh, we want to know what you want to see in a film, yeah. would they ever come up with... We specifically want to see promiscuous teenagers being murdered yeah. and a virginal teenager surviving. Not, yeah. Yeah. Is, that, is that something people want? Well, that's the thing, yeah. It's, it's, but it's whether or not... You know, maybe it does... Time, I, don't, I don't know enough about the culture around the time mm. of this film being made to know whether or not it was like, you know, it really did become like, you know, if you go off and cavort down a lover's lane, you might fall victim to someone like the Zodiac Killer. Yeah. And one way of avoiding that is to not... Is to be celibate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe that was like a thing that yeah. people did or didn't do, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. in, in order to avoid this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if you're... I like the idea. Imagine yeah. if, you're, if you're off the mark, you're really off the mark. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it follows, though, is like set in some weird sort of like time frame mm where it's not clear what the year is, but it all yeah. looks like sort of 1970s Yeah, I mean, I, there, there is a big comparison between It Follows and this film, because the, the adults are completely... Absent, yeah. yeah. It's the point where, if you, go, if you literally, if you go to adults for help, they'll close their windows, mm. close their blinds. It's, I think It Follows takes a lot from Halloween. Yeah, 
I think that's it. Down to even the setting, the suburbs, and the the shots of them walking around the streets, being stalked. It well, it follows with a better movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, like you know, I think I certainly can. I was watching Halloween, and I could see why it was considered a classic. Yeah, and I think um, you can see that it's you can. You can see that it's been really influential. Yes. What are your thoughts? Like, we've talked about Friday the 13th, and we've talked about Nightmare on Elm Street, talking about Halloween. What are your thoughts on franchises in horror films? Well, I, I can see why they do it in terms of financial return. Because yeah. it always amazes... I mean, I read through the... I mean, I read through the Friday the 13th pages when we first did Friday the 13th. Yeah. Back in episode one. And it's just astounding. They, they cost about... A million pounds to make and they, they bring back 10 20 30 times that yeah they're just cash cows yeah but i mean like you can you can see from I, a fan's I, perspective though yeah and I, I always feel like when it, when a sequel comes out that's unnecessary yeah you just kind of go well why yeah less is more yeah with these sorts of things yeah because you're gonna mess it up the, i mean you can count the number of sequels that were good yeah. on one hand yeah and like especially horror sequels yeah as well. they're just you're just you're tuning in to see the same things happen again, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we talked last week about Friday the Thirteenth mm. Part Two, which I think is an embodiment of that. I haven't seen any other Halloween films, but I mean, there, there's a number of them, and then a remake, and then a sequel to the remake as well. Halloween directed by Rob Zombie. Oh, okay. Right. And yes. Then Halloween yeah, yeah. Two directed maybe by Rob Zombie. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. They, they were the first of the sort of new wave remakes right yeah I think they did Texas Chainsaw Massacre first and they did uh, The Hills Have Eyes as well. yes that's true um, which I found out a lot of people actually consider better than well that's not hard yeah that's very true um, I just wonder if like if, I wonder how depressing it must be if you went and saw this film in 1978 you thought this is brilliant it's mm. absolutely brilliant it's my favourite film like, it's a great great horror film and then you've just got 20, 20 years of like shit remakes and mm. sequels like, it must just be soul destroying to see like something you love churn yeah. out. I mean, like the closest thing that we've had is probably like Saw and right. Paranormal Activity, maybe. Yeah, Saw. The first one was a good premise, and it was like it was tense to watch. Yeah, it was and after Saw, that, Saw One is a really good film. Saw Two is not bad. Yeah, but they. I mean, they go downhill. Yeah, I mean, by the time you get to Saw whatever fifteen, yeah, it's just oh god. Like yeah. it, you were only tuning in to see. The trap. Yeah, see how elaborate these yeah. traps that this... And the fact that you're even bothering to work a story into it is frankly insulting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, it, it happens with every horror franchise. It doesn't happen as much with other franchises. It doesn't happen as much with other genres. I don't know. I mean, look at the superheroes. Yeah, but the superhero films, they're like, they're, they're not yearly and they're not like, you know, you could you could say that you know, Avengers 1 and Avengers 2 are similar levels of quality. But I think you that's know. just due to the the budgets behind them. I mean, if you look at Shrek. Shrek was really good. They just yeah. cashed in, boom, 2, 3, 4. Then it's 5, but yeah. that, that's just milking it. Yeah. And they're, 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 they're enjoyable films. But it's because they've got so much studio funding behind them, because, right. because they're making money. So you think that it's a budgetary thing that means that horror sequels typically aren't any good? Basically, yeah. But then, like, it doesn't... Uh, I'm not sure that adds up, because initially, often they won't know if a film's going to be a hit. You know, Saw 2 would have had a bigger budget than Saw 1. True. Saw 3 probably had a bigger budget than Saw 2. Yeah. So, like, how do they... I mean, it, it's, I, I, but then you also there's a combination look at, of... Look at it this way. If, if Wes Craven had spent the first 20 years of his life with the, the idea of Nightmare on Elm Street rattling around in his head, and it was his pet project, and he was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. Yeah. He makes it, and they go, that was great, and they'll do another one in a year. Yeah. It's not going to be as good. I mean, that's the same thing with True Detective. Apparently, the first True Detective series took sort of 15 years to write. Right. So whack one out the following year, yeah. it's not going to have the same quality. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a fair point. I think it's, I think it's an interesting... Um, Can you name a good horror sequel? Uh, well, there's Aliens. Well, that's more of an action film. Well, that's the thing, though, isn't it? It's, like, it's, it's taking, a sequel to a horror film. It's, it's, it's almost like James Cameron saw... Alien mm. and was like I, I, I love this film yeah. this is a great film I love the Alien and I want to make my own Alien film now. is that your James Cameron voice? no 
he's much he's much smugger. Yeah. Um, but you know, he wants to make his own thing because yeah. he put his own but just in the same universe. Yeah. 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 Which that's, is, to be to be to his credit. Yeah. And then like Alien Three, Alien Four are terrible. Yeah. Prometheus is pretty bad. It's, it's not not as good as Alien. No. It? I mean, Alien, amazing horror film, like masterclass in horror. Yeah. Aliens, masterclass in action film. Yeah. But they're totally yeah, like totally yeah. different films. Chalk and cheese. Yeah. Um, it's really, really hard to name a really good horror sequel. Well, maybe listeners, if you've got any... We have a competition. If you, <laughs> yeah. if you can name a good horror sequel... Yeah. But genuinely, look, we're, we're not judging anything before. We're, we'll watch everything you mention. Yeah. And we'll tell you if it's any good. Send it in to howtosurviveshow at gmail.com and the winner... We'll, we'll, not, we'll name you on air and we'll, we'll send you an Amazon voucher for £20. Okay. All right? Yeah. It's our first, first competition. First competition. Yeah. So in Halloween, the doctor, the, the psychologist, Dr. Mm-hmm. Loomis. Yeah. I just want to talk through what he does during the film. Okay. So this is a trained professional. Yeah. Who is this, is, this is following on from, this is almost becoming a regular section, Joe's uh, psychology critique yeah. after uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. With the sleep psychologist. <laughs> sleep psychologist. Yeah. Well, this guy, I don't know what his branch of psychology is. But, I mean, I'm assuming criminal psychology. Yeah, it's probably fair, fair to assume. I don't know if that is a branch of psychology, but, you know, he's, he, he does deal with... The psychology of criminals. Yes. Yeah. All those who are mentally ill in a violent way. It's yeah. Maximum so security, mental hospital. Let's talk through, step by step, what he does in the film. Yeah. So it, it's, it opens on him in a car, being driven by a nurse mm-hmm. to the hospital. Yeah. And she's smoking. I, I don't know why they're together. Yeah. Do you, any ideas? Are, uh, they, are they having an affair? No, they're, they're just, just they're, they're, heading, they're heading to the hospital mm. because uh, the, the, what, I, what I understand is that Michael Myers, it's been 15 years, his review hearing is, has, coming, is up. coming up. Yeah. And so they're discussing between them how they're going to... I mean, I don't know why they need to... If he's that evil, as yeah. he obviously is, like, he doesn't talk, he's catatonic, and he's like <laughs> a psychopath. Yeah. Right. But they're, for some reason, they, they appear to be concerned that he might be able to... Pass parole. Yeah. yeah. Um, what I think is interesting is the nurse, uh, who's presumably a mental health professional, yeah. uh, refers to Michael Myers as, as it, not him, <laughs> And then uh, says uh, they don't. She doesn't like it when they talk all that gibberish. <laughs> oh. Imagine a mental health nurse going, oh, "I hate it when they're just shouting their gibberish all the time." <laughs> well, she's. I guess she gets her come up and she gets thrown from the car. Yeah. Uh, and it was stolen by Michael Myers. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm going to bring this up again, right? The car thing. So I'll put a pin in that for now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I think I know where you're going with the car then. <laughs> Right, so Michael Myers escapes yeah. in the car, and we're that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's fine. <laughs> so the doctor, Doctor Loomis, yeah. takes another car and he drives yeah. to where he thinks Michael Myers is going. Yeah, Harrington. Yeah, Illinois. Harrington, Illinois. Yeah, he stops to make a call, mm-hmm. but to no one in particular. He doesn't name who he's talking to, but he says, "For God's sake, ready yourselves because he's coming." Yeah. to Harrington. Harrington, Harrenfield. Haddonfield, I believe. He's coming to Haddonfield. So he, he calls them, no one in particular. Yeah. He says, for God's sake, get yourself ready. Hangs up the phone and he walks over, uh, just out of the corner of his eye, he notices something, which just happens to be a murder scene. Which Michael Myers, by Michael Myers. Yeah. With Michael Myers, where he stole someone's clothes. Yeah. So later, he arrives in town and his first port of call, where do you think he'd go? Oh no, he doesn't go to the police. He doesn't go to where he thinks Michael Myers might be. He goes to the, the churchyard. Mm-hmm. And I, I think the, the grave digger? Yeah. Or I think maybe he's a... The, the attendant of the right. graveyard. Yeah. He takes him to Judith Myers' grave. Yeah. Where they discover that the, the gravestone is missing. Yeah. Kids these days. Kids these days, yeah. Yeah. And at that point, he goes to the sheriff. Yeah. Who is busy at a break-in. We'll get to... I'm going to get to this. Yeah, yeah. So okay. we'll put a pin in the break-in. This yeah. is going to come up again. And he says to the sheriff, have you got, have you got a minute? Because I need to tell you something. I've driven from wherever where I was before to tell you this. And the sheriff says, give me 10 minutes. This is noon. Right. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's light. So 10 minutes pass, it's, and it's dark, <laughs> and they're at the murder house. Yeah. They pull up outside the murder house, which is Michael Myers' family home, and they go in, and they find a dead dog. Mm-hmm. And 
they agree among themselves that it was probably a skunk. All right? So the plan that the psychologist hatches, I mean, at this point, if, if I'm the sheriff... Yeah. I mean... All, all points bulletin. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is the reason that they don't put out a call for all people to look for this guy? Mm. Well, the, what he says is, the, the psychologist tells the policeman how to do his job by saying, we don't want... Because if you tell the police to look for him, if you put an APB, yeah. they're going to see him on every corner and they're going to see him in every home. Yeah. Is that so because ben, it's Halloween? Yeah, I guess so. But then, because he's, he's wearing a mask. Yeah, but he's in disguise. Isn't what it? does he look like? He hasn't always worn a mask. Take the mask off. Excuse me, sir. We're, you're six foot five. <laughs> um, and we're wearing a mask. Okay. Yeah, but he... Yeah, yeah but, he's, but he's... Um, he steals a mask from the, the hardware shop. Yeah. Along with some knives... And whatever else it is. Yeah. But so, yeah, my point is, he is very, very tall. Yeah. And, I mean, just, just say, if there's anyone... Yeah, no, no, I, ta- I take the point, yeah, yeah. Anyway, but, he, tells him, he tells the sheriff not to bother, because, I don't know, he's getting involved in police work. Yeah. Fair enough. So, he decides, he elects to stay there himself, and await Michael Myers' return, mm-hmm. whereupon he will presumably act uh, yeah, by shoot. subduing him, even yeah. though he's deathly scared of him. Yeah. But he says, don't tell anyone. So he waits there all night, outside the house. Makes yeah. a child, like some children, jump. But they, they walk up to the house. Yeah. Gets a good laugh out of that. But then he leaves his post, breaks his own plan. Yeah. And just by chance, he walks past where he thinks Michael Myers might be. Just oh, intuition. Yeah. Plot, plot intuition. Mm-hmm. And sees some children screaming, running out of the house. Yeah. On Halloween. Runs in there with his gun drawn. Yeah. Shoots Michael Myers without even blinking. Yeah. In... I think one shot sends him over the balcony and then from where he stood, where he can't see Michael Myers' body, he carries him trying to shoot five more shots. Well, he sh- yeah, he shoots him six times and then uh, what I thought was quite funny is he ascertains that he's run out of bullets by pulling the trigger again, yeah. which if he, if he hasn't run out of bullets, he's just going to shoot a gun <laughs> he, he shoot, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, a, in a random direction. Very good. Well, I don't know what part of this yeah. is in line with the sort of normal remit or yeah. no, training I see, I see what you mean. of yeah. a psychologist. But the, the thing that's really worrying mm-hmm. is that he says, as soon as I met that boy, when he was six years old, I knew he was pure evil. Yeah. Do you know what gave it away? Not the fact that he killed someone. Yeah. Not the fact that he was non-responsive to any emotion. Mm-hmm. It was his eyes, Chris. Yeah. Black eyes. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the diagnostic criteria. Of the right. uh, the mental hospitals <laughs> in Illinois. Well, he did spend like eight years trying to, you know. Well, he said the minute he saw him. He he yeah, knew. but he yeah. Okay. Well, it's this, it's equivalent to saying that that kid give me the creeps. So let's let's talk about the car because I know I know <laughs> what you're gonna say. Right. I've got it written down here. Okay, go on. Like he, he drives off in a car, and the nurse quite rightly says, "How how in blazes can he drive a car?" Yeah. And the doctor apologetically says, "Well, maybe someone around there gave him lessons." Yeah. Is that a confession? No. The so there's a Halloween novel. Okay. Uh, adaptation. Uh, wait, which came first? It was it was after the film came out. So it's a novelization of of, of the, the film. film right? Yeah. But that's a thrill. Yeah. Uh, which came out almost twelve years later, I think. Right. I mean, who's begging for a Halloween novel after twelve <laughs> years? But we've, um, we've all been waiting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in which. The explanation for the Michael Myers being able to drive is that uh, from the back seat when Dr. Loomis was driving him from place to place on, on occasion, he observed very closely and learned to drive by watching. <laughs> how, you've learned to drive a car, Chris. Yeah, I have, yeah. Famously. How, how long did it take you? A um, few months. Did you pass first time? I did, yeah. I'm quite crazy. Yeah. Did you? I had second time. Me. Oh, right, okay. But you knew that, did you? Yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's, like I say, it took, took a few months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it something you could pick up by looking? Well, I mean, you, we, you, don't know, we don't know. We don't know how, how clever he is. Yeah. Do you think he, maybe he's like a Michael Schofield sort of thing? Like he took the car to pieces <laughs> in his mind? Yeah, well, he also... I mean, there's, there's something obviously supernatural about Michael Myers because he takes multiple severe wounds mm. to even down at which point after 30 seconds he's able to walk off again so you think it's just I don't know I don't maybe, know maybe 
devils are telling him what to do. Maybe. Oh, you mentioned the policeman. Yeah. Who, of, of course, he is her friend's father. <laughs> yeah. Right? That's... That's a, always the case. I mean, every, how many films have we had with policemen in so far? And how many times have they been their father? Well, there was The Loved Ones. Yeah. And there was Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, both of which had a... a, a yeah. A father so who two was out of twelve. Yeah. Yeah. All those films. <laughs> uh, Three out of twelve. Well, I mean, in Alien, twenty-five percent. In Alien, yeah. of course, there's yeah. there's a famous scene where Ripley's and Jurassic World. Ripley's father is the policeman. I think Jura- that's well, Jurassic things. World. At the end of Jurassic World, the kid's aunt's boyfriend is sort of the policeman of Jurassic World. Well, I'm going to give <laughs> you that because it supports my point. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So the, the policeman absolutely feckless. The tombstone's been stolen. Must be kids. Mm. Kids uh, will do anything. They break into the hardware store. They've stolen a mask and knives. Ah, it's kids. Yeah. Dog's been killed, mm. gutted, to the point where it's no longer recognisable as a dog. It must be a skunk. Then he creeps up on the psychiatrist who's standing guard outside the house. Mm. Is, that, is that good police? But you know what? This, this is one of the cliches that it subverts, actually. Because the policeman doesn't get killed by going into the house with his gun drawn. Yeah, without his gun drawn. Or either. Yeah, with, yeah just with no situation or whatnot. Yeah. yeah, that's very true. So it's that time of the show, as ever, Joe, mm-hmm. where we discuss how you would survive Halloween. Do you have any ideas? Okay, so this is kind of meta, because uh, it's kind of based on how other movies I've seen. Right. But generally, when the dogs start acting up, yeah. It's a signal that something's amiss. Okay. And in this one, the dog starts barking to indicate there's an intruder present. Yeah. And rather than go, you're right, dog. Hmm. Um, or finding out what's wrong with you, know, pay a little attention to the animals. Yeah. Annie says, shut up. Judy, shut this dog up. Yeah. Yeah. So, so on a basic level, you're saying pay more attention to the dog. Yes, because if, she, if she'd done that, she'd have found out what the dog was barking at, which was Michael Myers, mm-hmm. and she may have been able to raise the alarm, yeah. thus rendering, uh, rendering him basically unable to kill her. Yeah. yeah. There's a there's an advert on the London Underground at the moment, Joe, I don't know if you've seen it, mm. which is for home insurance, okay. which is a picture of a dog, and the point of the advert is saying, this is our dog. <laughs> yeah, he was yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. useless when we were burgled because he slept right through it. Yeah. What I take from both that advert and your analysis is... If you've got a dog who reacts strongly to intruders, mm. then pay more attention to it yeah. and, you know, actually you utilise that as a, as a method of keeping yourself well, alive. Ideally, you'd want a dog that was not over, overwrought by but intruders. Not jumpy. No. I mean, if it was barking at the postman and, mm. and like any, any birds that fly past. Because it would normalise yeah. the barking. Exactly. So um, you, you'd say, shut up, stupid dog. Yeah, so what you, you need yeah. is... A dog a that dog only barks when there's genuine threat. Yeah. yeah. So a dog that's Jason Bourne. Yes. <laughs> yeah. A, a dog that can not only assess a situation, yeah. Yeah. but also deal out advice on how to deal yeah. with it. Yeah, have a level of situational awareness yeah. that is unmatched. Yes. Well, I mean, at, at, the, at the nearer end, living within the realms of the film, that dog is giving her a yeah. signal and she's ignoring it. And that's, that's my first idea on how I survive. How do you think I'd fare? I think that's 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 relatively relatively fair. Yeah, you're just because you're not really um, aside from. You, I mean, you're making a, an assumption that her dog isn't a jumpy dog. He is barking at Michael Myers because yeah. he, he goes and then he, Michael Myers kills the dog. Yeah, because no one would listen to him. Yeah, and she hears him. Uh, hears the dog being killed, and she's like, "Oh, you know, like because she she tells tells her the." kid that she's watching to mm. shut the dog up and then the dog whimpers as, as it's, it's being, being strangled yeah. and she goes oh never mind yeah stupid dogs yeah yeah so i mean this this goes back to annie being a horrible person yeah so don't be a horrible person don't be a horrible person listen to the dog yeah join the rspca yes any ideas chris how would you survive um my one's quite a simple one yeah. um and i don't believe that this is uh, contradicting any rules. Okay. Um, it's utilising something that every character has there has available to them, and whether or not this is a permanent solution to the problem is is 
neither here nor there. You know, when I'm actually telling you it, you, yeah. you may feel differently. Lock your doors. <laughs> Lock your doors. Yeah. Like the neighbours do. Yeah, that's true. And they don't. They survive. They're fine. <laughs> yeah. They're absolutely You're not fine. Good in their no, yeah. there's a demonstrable link in the film between locking your doors <laughs> and true. staying alive. Right. Yeah. So none of their houses appear to be locked. We talked about the the kids just walking into the house, going upstairs and shagging, mm. as though that's like a normal yeah, or yeah. appropriate thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Right. If they locked the doors, then at many stages during the film, you're making it much harder. For, and this is like often we talk about things like oh, let's do this or that because it would make make it harder for the killer, yeah. you know, to do. And and we're talking about really abstract or like weird, you know, things like be, depending on the nature of yeah. whoever the monster is of that week. This is literally something that you should do in real life <laughs> because it's a genuine method of keeping yourself alive in this exact scenario. Yes. I mean, home invasion. Yeah. yeah. Preventing your home from being In invaded. fact, if, if Michael had been there not to kill them, but to rob them, yeah. they wouldn't be able to claim on the insurance. They're idiots. Yeah. I mean, yeah, their health insurance may not be valid either. Yeah. Because this is America, so yeah, they, exactly. their health insurance may not be valid in, in the event of a home invasion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And like, sort of second, secondarily to that, if you live in a culture or a neighbourhood where doors aren't locked and neighbours don't help one another, move. Yeah. Don't live in that culture. That's a, not a nice place to be. If you're... Imagine, imagine if you're being chased by a murderer and you're banging on your neighbour's door, right? <laughs> but one thing, like, you know, neighbours might be too scared to look or to answer, right, right. right? If they're old or infirm or if they're, you know... You know, scared because yeah. it's the middle of the night, and that's fine. But for a neighbour to look out of the window, go, oh, there's a woman covered in blood on, on my doorstep, mm. behind my locked door that she can't get into, and presumably most people won't be able to. Oh, look, there's a man wearing a white mask in the middle of the night, Carrying holding a, a massive bloody knife. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'll pull the curtains. Yeah, I'm... I don't, gonna... e- I don't even want to see how it will play out. Yeah. I'm going to just, I'm going to be passive in this situation to the extent that I'm going to pretend that none of it is happening, right? That, maybe, that's tantamount to murder, basically. Maybe they're in fear of uh, litigation should they get involved. <laughs> what, like, so, uh, so, what, on the behalf of the victim? Yeah, so if, they, if they'd stepped in and punched Michael Myers in the face and subdued him yeah. and then got sued by Michael Myers. <laughs> the state yeah. representing Michael Myers. Or they subdued Michael Myers and whilst escaping like from the scene, Jamie Lee Curtis slipped on their porch yeah. and broke her ankle. Yeah. And she sued Tripped them. on their garden hose. Yeah. yeah. It's, and she sued. It's, it's much cheaper in that sense uh, in terms of self-preservation. That's true. To not get involved at all. But, um, I mean, they do do one thing, right? And that's locking the doors. Yeah, they? that's true. And as ever, Joe situational awareness is yeah. a crucial element obviously we talked earlier about the scenes where Michael Myers is mm. stood behind them they don't notice Annie go Annie tries to get in a, a locked car and doesn't have the keys and she's right. like oh I need to get the keys goes and gets the keys comes back opens the door without using the keys and sits in the car <laughs> and it's only at that point she realizes oh there's something not right here yeah. and then she's dead if she the second she lifts the handle and the latch comes undone she should go hang on I just went back inside to get the keys to open this very door the door is now open I trust my prior judgement that the door was locked and at that point and I'll turn my head yeah. two degrees yeah. to see that there is someone in the car and at that point that's the point at which she should do a reverse handspring out of the garage <laughs> and take off at full speed yeah. sprint. To so somewhere with a locked door. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. No, all right, all right. Well, and we do see Michael punch through a door, but that's an internal door. It's not a, it's not a fire door or a, or a front I don't door. Think you could, I don't think you could get through the sort of heavy duty front, front doors, a thick yeah, Solid security wood. door mm. sort of thing, yeah. Well, I've got one more way I'd survive. Yeah. And if 
One thing that's important about Michael Myers is where he's come from. Okay. And the only person that really knows that is the doctor, Dr. Loomis, mm -hmm. and the sheriff. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, the sheriff should have raised the alarm. Should have told everyone to stay in their homes. And sure. Had a patrol out looking for Michael Myers. And in that event, people would have known that he was on the loose, perhaps. Yeah. And they would have said, okay, there's an escape mental patient. A, here. An, aw an aware victim is yes. a victim that's safer. Exactly. That's one part. But that's not my main way of surviving. But that would, that would help. Yeah. But should you then find out, okay, there's an escape mental patient, I'll tell you the safest place you can go. The mental hospital. <laughs> that's he's not going back there. He's, he's not going there. Yeah. But it is quite a drive, isn't it? It's like yeah, a day's drive. Yeah. An aware public is a safer public. Yeah. And I presume... Information is power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I presume that they'd be able to set up some sort of, you know... Neighbourhood watch. Yeah, or like a, you know, a safe space which is guarded amply by, mm. um, and ably by police officers. So you say, fill a sort of school gymnasium with exactly, yeah. the whole town. Yeah. And have marksmen around the perimeter. Yeah. Until Michael Myers is subdued. Yeah. Well, but like then it. he's supernatural, so maybe, maybe it's impossible. Okay. Maybe it's folly. We don't know. Yeah. Maybe we need to watch all of the other Halloween films. I'll tell you what, well... Why don't we watch the next one next Halloween? <laughs> okay, that's yeah. the deal. All right. Have we had any listener correspondence, Jay? We have. Uh, Matt writes in. Okay. He says, I get mixed up with my Friday the 13th or Halloween. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't? I mean, yeah, we've, we've called I, I dare say in this you'll find unedited, uh, <laughs> unedited yeah. versions of us calling Michael Jason. Jason Michael and yeah. all those sort of things. Yep. But both, it, it, like he said, it applies mm -hmm. in either. Um, Well-lit locations, mm -hmm. large crowded areas okay. with lots of people and my friends with me at all times okay. and never alone. Yeah, it's interesting because um, Friday the 13th obviously takes place in a sort of relative seclusion. Yeah. Whereas this is a pretty bustling suburb. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, only, the, the only thing that sort of makes them vulnerable is the fact that they're on their own. Literally, yeah. I mean, if to be fair, if a six foot five man with a knife came in this room now, he could probably overpower us. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's I'd, probably I mean, I'd, I'd push you towards him, so he. <laughs> yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah, I've um, got a dodgy ankle, so yeah, he's not outrunning me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You only hold me back. Yeah, but certainly on your own, you yeah. can do trouble. Yeah, safety, so, in safety in crowds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and he said, stay in locations with long distance viewpoints, so you can see anything approaching. It's very similar to it follows. Yeah, exactly. Another letter mm -hmm. from uh, from Chris McSweeney. He says. Michael Myers never runs. Mm -hmm. Walk swiftly away, heading in the direction of a large open area. Maybe yeah. get on a bus, inform yeah. the authorities, and job done. Michael Myers does use transport, though. That's true. He can drive a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, you could get on a bus. Uh, I wonder if he would, if you were, say, like 50 yards away from him, would he keep walking if you were walking, or would he get in a car? Well, because it's quicker. Yeah. Well, is it like is it like he is bound to walk while his victims are walking? But as soon as they get in transport, <laughs> he's always fair well, they, game. Uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> but he doesn't know who his victims are when he first gets in the car. That's true. And does he by the end even like? In, does he know them? Is it like targeted? No, I don't it think. So. I don't. I think it can be for Jamie Lee Curtis because she kind of like. She's Icarus. She flew too close to the sun. Yeah. Uh, and her wings burned off. Yeah. yeah. She fell in the sea. But maybe we're mixing metaphors. Yeah. Laboring metal. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, but that's generally a, a good bit of advice. I like it. Well, I think that's about it for this year's Halloween special. Yeah. Uh, next, next year will be Halloween part two. Yeah. Um, if you can't wait until then and you want to hear more ways to survive slasher films, yeah. uh, refer to the release of two or three days ago, which was Friday the 13th Part 2, or yeah. to our, the rest of our back catalogue, which includes Friday the 13th Part 1. Yeah, and It Follows, yeah. uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, yeah. all sorts of classics. Yes, and do let us know what you think about the show, how we can improve it, any feedback, any suggestions for movies we should watch, any ideas on how you would survive in the movies we already talked about, we'll always bring them up. Yeah. That's howtosurviveshow at gmail.com. And you can find all of our information and previous podcasts on howtosurviveshow.com. Yeah, and certainly subscribe. Whatever you're listening to us on, SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes, the radio. <laughs> I mean, we've got a radio deal now, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. yeah, Radio 4. All right. 
Um, See you next time. Yeah, and uh, sorry for all the gibberish we've been talking. Mm. I know how much you hate it. <laughs>